Sharon Rabb, it's quoted in today's Dayton Daily News saying that war ultimately leads to peace. It was President Abraham Lincoln who said, a house divided cannot stand. And isn't it fascinating that one of the writers who, Frederick, who Abraham Lincoln read during war was Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass wrote about the need to stop the bloodshed against African American people and to heal the wounds of this country. I am going to be introducing Patricia Engel. Uh, but I have sort of an instruction here how to pronounce Hala's name. And there's something here, there's a line here, it says, like the musical note. So I've been walking around town saying, <laughs> Hala from La La Land. That made me sort of get as close to saying it correctly as I could. Anyway, <clears throat> Patricia Engel, the 2017 Dayton Literary Peace Prize fiction winner for The Veins of the Ocean, is the author of Vita, which was a New York Times Notable Book of the Year and a finalist for the Penn Hemingway Fiction Award and Young Lions Fiction Award in the acclaimed novel, It's Not Love, It's Just Paris. <laughs> That's what I told a former girlfriend once. <laughs> Her work has appeared in the Atlantic, in the Boston Review, a public space, Harvard Review, in Guernica, among other publications and anthologies, and received numerous awards, including a 2014 Fellowship in Literature from the National Endowment for the Arts, ladies and gentlemen, Patricia Ingall. Um, it's so wonderful to be back in Dayton. I was here just a year ago. Thank you, Sharon and Mark Meester, for bringing me back, and Mark and all the volunteers, Ermi, who's been driving them right here around. It's, it's so lovely to be among such warm people, people asking about my parents who were here last year. It's, it's so nice. So um, it's great to be among old friends, some friends that I don't see very often, and here they are, like Bob and Margaret and Kill and new friends, all the wonderful people I've met this year, and so many dazzling writers, and all of you who believe that literature will bring us closer to peace. I'm especially honored to be back here to introduce to you this year's winner of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize in Fiction, Hala Alian. I first encountered the words of Hala Alian a few years ago through a poem a friend shared with me, accompanied by a video showing stark images of war in Palestine. The poem is titled Gaza, and I listened to it over and over, meditating on lines like, this I did not know, they made smoke like ocean. This is counting your loss, this is losing count. And this is diaspora, 
This always through a television screen. This always the wrong questions. This five other coastlines. This is gutless. This is don't change the channel. The least I can do is watch. This is diaspora. This is carry your name in Bangkok. This is carry your name in Brooklyn. This is wrecking ball of compass. This is weight. This is, I did not know they made sky so famished. And it goes on. Like her award-winning poetry, Hala Allianz fiction is a reckoning, placing its audience at the fractured center of so much loss. Her extraordinary novel, Salt Houses, is an expansive portrait of both a family and a nation uprooted by war and diaspora. It forces the reader to confront the betrayals of colonialism and how this faraway war we often only consider through pixelated scenes of ash and rubble, headlines and photos of wounded children that tug at our soul for a day or two until our busy lives take our attention elsewhere. The lethal theater of faith and rage and how what so many see as a mere political talking point or a geographical conundrum has left an entire people displaced and so many, so, so many dead. Salt Houses is a family quest. We follow the, the Yakub clan over five generations from 1963 to 2014, starting in Nablus with the wedding of Alia and a mysterious prophecy withheld by her mother, Salma. Driven out of their beloved homeland by the threat of attack, we are thrust into the perspectives of various family members as exile takes them from Palestine to Kuwait, Jordan, Paris, Beirut, the United States, and Jaffa. Alian shows us the intimate consequences of war through a family with the means to leave while others are forced to stay. Like any family, there are secrets, things left unsaid, unfulfilled desires, disillusions, and the heartache of the unknowable. With lyrical and undeniably poetic language, Alian, who also happens to be a doctor of psychology, gives us an exquisite rendering of intergenerational trauma and the silences around it as the family grapples with the death of their beloved son, brother, and uncle, Mustafa. Over 50 years, through shifts and folds of different political regimes and more battles, we see the family transformed by distance and estrangement from their point of origin, what they hold on to, and what they are forced to surrender. Alian shows us that displacement is also a transcendence of identity through immigration. More than just a shift of status, it is a reimagining and reconstruction of the idea of home, even if in many ways home will always remain a question to be answered. Alia's daughter, Suad, tells her own children her reasons for wanting to leave Boston, where they live now, to return to Beirut, which she considers a sort of home now. Alia says, home as in somewhere familiar, somewhere people look like us, where you guys can learn Arabic and be near your grandparents and never come home asking what raghead means. Later we read, in Beirut, Suad has gone back to being Palestinian. To everyone from the cab drivers to the bank tellers, her accent exposes her. It reminds her of Kuwait. As a girl, this cataloging of origins never struck her as strange. Kuwait was a place of expatriation, and everyone seemed to come from somewhere else. Even if a, pe if a person's heritage was flimsy, unused for years, you were always where your father was from. Through so much loss, until its devastating final pages, Salt Houses shows us that even if forced to leave our homes, our homes never leave us. That memory is both a sanctuary and a haunting, and love is the map that guides us as we each navigate our personal exiles. 
In a TEDx talk, Hala Alian described her own upbringing, having lived in many countries and across the Middle East, moving with her family every few years until she lay roots of her own in New York, and how, throughout her many moves, she came to see reading certain adored books as a refuge and an act of homecoming. In Salt Houses, she has created a new home for us all. Please join me in welcoming Hala Alian. Thank you. Good evening. Um, thank you so much for that remarkably generous introduction, Patricia. It is so thrilling to be here right now um, and to share this evening with so many writers and artists, all these people I've met in the last couple of days, Bob, Gilbert, Susan, Margaret, Will, Patricia, David, as well as supporters of the arts. And in particular, I cannot overstate how excited I am to be sharing this stage with these literary forces of nature that have won this year. I've been a reader longer than I've been a writer, and if I can just be a fan for a second, to Min Michelle, to John Tanahasi, I find your works and your visions to be so inspiring, and it's been really lovely to get to know you over the last couple of days. I wanted to start by thanking Sharon and Mark, all of the board members, as well as everyone involved in making this lovely weekend and this event run so beautifully and smoothly. Thank you so much to the judges for selecting this book, to the city of Dayton for your legacy and peace work in making this possible. Honestly, this entire community has been so welcoming and so kind, and I'm a little bit in love with all of you. <laughs> it's not love, it's Dayton. Um, and I, <laughs> I don't know if that deserved applause, but I'll take it. <laughs> um, and I also wanted to just say thank you so much to the readers, um, both the readers for the prize and just the readers in general, to everyone who has read any of the books being recognized tonight and anyone who will read it, uh, read any of them, thank you. I want to say thank you to Johnny and to my loves, Maryam and Talal, and to my mama and my baba. Um, I think more than any country or city, I come from you. So, I wrote a book about Palestine, and if I could have dreamt up an award to win, it would have been this one. The mission of promoting peace and acknowledging literature as a vehicle for empathy and human understanding resonates so deeply with me and what it is that has always galvanized me both in my work as a writer and a psychologist. My days are spent both bearing witness to the stories of others and creating them myself. And over the years, I've also witnessed the true transformative power of narrative. We become the stories we tell ourselves. Our societies, our tribes, our countries, they become the stories they tell. The narratives they publish in textbooks and headlines. When I think about marginalized communities, the first thing that comes to mind is erasure, which is, of course, the antithesis of peace. Peace thrives on visibility, on transparency and accountability and other big, buzzy $5 words that really just mean the capacity of a person or a country or an institution to say, I see you, I witness you. If I have wronged you, I will find the language to acknowledge it. If I have more access or privilege than you, I will use my voice to amplify yours. Marginalized communities and narratives have long withstood erasure. Textbooks retell the story of the very soil we are all standing on right now. Streets and towns all over the world are named after oppressors and colonizers who are recast as heroes. Erasure has justified slavery, war, occupation. It determines what stories get told, in what tongue, determines who can take up space, what identities are palatable. I recognize my privilege the luck and education and upward familial economic mobility that happened alongside the marginalization of being born Palestinian, being born to parents who would seek asylum in this country, of growing up in over a dozen cities, making a home in the diasporic identity. Only in recognizing our privilege as much as our marginalization can we begin to contemplate the fight for peace. 
When I think of peace, I think of cities. At Oxwaydan, the village my father came from that's long been raised and erased from history. Beirut, Brooklyn, Dallas, Tripoli, Abu Dhabi, Norman, Oklahoma. These places that have made up my identity like unrelated stars being linked into a coherent constellation. When I set out to write my novel, Salt Houses, a multi-generational story about a Palestinian family, my biggest question, concern, was how to write the diaspora. The novel begins in the early 60s with the family's matriarch and follows their multiple displacements and identity formation and exile into the present day. Daily, I worked with the currency of memory, of inherited trauma, of intergenerational displacement and the effects that has. You see, certain identities exist not in the presence of something, but in the absence of it. And this ultimately is the conflict of hyphenated identities, what it means to live in emotional and literal borderlands, making something sometimes with nothing. Peace, then, becomes synonymous with resilience, synonymous with wedding parties among ruins and kite flying under siege with making art and music even in the face of war and occupation and fear, not knowing if your children's going to live to fifth grade, with telling stories. The function of storytelling on a psychological and anthropological level is partly to connect with others, to stretch our imaginations like a muscle, but it's also rehearsal. We rehearse our capacity for love in storytelling our fears, our adventures, even our deaths. We rehearse worlds without borders, worlds with equality, empathy. We rehearse peace. We write ourselves back into stolen narratives. That's what the writing of this novel felt like. I wrote the majority of this book in a country, in this country, that still doesn't formally recognize Palestinian sovereignty, doesn't recognize even the state of Palestine. But I think if marginalized communities have learned anything over the centuries, it's that the powers that be can shuffle around our borders and rewrite our maps and sell our recipes and labor and soil and fashion and even for some bodies, but they can't erase collective memory. The act of remembering finds a way. Life finds a way, survival finds a way. And one of the things I learned after this book came out was that somehow, the telling of this story became its own kind of recognition, perhaps the most precious kind, a recognition for which I am unspeakably grateful between readers, both strangers and family, Arabs and Westerners, everybody in between who reached out to say they felt witnessed in this story or that it had called upon them to do the witnessing, a recognition that continues today being awarded a literary peace prize for a novel about Palestine. For peace to exist, there has to be humanization. For peace to exist, there has to be representation. When I think of the most powerful art, photography, literature for me, they're often the ones that use the other to show us something about the self. Sometimes it's something broken or ugly or light-filled, but it reminds me that I belong to something larger, communal. I see it in my patients, I see it in my parents who came to this country with erased identities and bank accounts and raised artists and scientists and dreamers on foreign soil. And I see it in books, that first and last love of mine, in stories about middle-aged women in San Francisco and broken children in 19th century England and islands and outer space and pirates and love that allowed me to practice doing the witnessing. We talk often about gratitude when it comes to witnessing, but there's a power to it as well, a humility, an antidote to oppression. You see, the act of witnessing changes both the witnesser and the witnessed, and storytelling is the crux of that process, which is what makes the very existence of this prize so remarkable, so revolutionary, an attempt at countering erasure, at inviting writers to do the difficult, sacred work of telling the truth. And I feel so deeply honored to be part of this legacy, this beautiful Dayton tribe, honored to be recognized, to be seen, to be witnessed. Thank you.